Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning around the world. This is Jacob Paulson from Denver, Colorado, welcoming you to our August end of month webinar with Terry Griffith. We're really excited to, to have you with us, whether you be tuning in live or watching this recording. And we're really excited to hear from Terry and learn a little bit more about plugged in management. For those who are participating live on the call, uh, you can use Twitter hashtag or handle uh, PIM for plugged in manager 12 books uh, to talk about this and stay plugged in uh, directly on Twitter. And again, really appreciate uh, everyone's participation uh, so far, both in the, in the online discussion as well as in the book group, generally speaking. We're going to go ahead and, uh, and get started and uh, kind of give you a little bit of a, an introduction to the group. Uh, that's, that's a picture of me. I'm, I'm that guy with the pretty family. And I, I'll just kind of give you an idea how we came to do this, how this came around. I, I spent 2011 reading a lot of books and I approached the end of the year thinking a little bit about my 2012 goals. And I realized that reading a lot of books doesn't always mean you get much value out of any of them. And so I made a, a goal coming into 2012 to just read 12 books, but to get maximum value out of them. And as I thought about how I would get maximum value, I occurred, uh, you know, I, I thought of or it occurred to me two specific points. One, uh, getting a lot of other people to read the book with me, uh, the idea of a book group, which is a traditional concept. And then two, finding an expert to lead the discussion, somebody who really understands the material, and who better than the author. So we've set out this year, uh, kicking it off this year and hoping to continue uh, into the far distant future, uh, to really read uh, one book each month and to be led in that discussion by the author of that book and to get as many people as possible to follow with us. And ultimately, uh, the tag we put together was to get 12 quality authors to lead 12,000 people in a discussion of 12 books in 2012, as it were. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're coming from and what we've promised our members uh, we promise bonus materials from the author, whether they'll be available on the author's website or things we distribute uh, via the site. Online discussion with other group members uh, that's led by the author, and this, this month has been no exception. We've had a phenomenal discussion taking place on our Goodreads uh, page that Terry's been very actively engaged in. It's been very, very wonderful and, and educational. Uh, we promise, of course, this live webinar at the, at the end of each month and a chance to win books and other prizes from authors. And we I had 15 different people who won an autographed signed copy of the Plugged In Manager this month, and we were able to get those out in the mail and appreciate everyone's participation in those promotions and giveaways. And just uh, lastly, as part of this introduction, to give you an idea of what's upcoming uh, in the, the next fall, coming, coming months. In the next couple of days, we'll be starting September, and we'll be reading a new book called The Inner Edge, The Ten Practices of Personal Leadership. Uh, I, I have just picked up my copy. I haven't uh, opened it yet, but it looks to be a phenomenal read. I've read the reviews and a little bit of the information about it, and I'm really excited uh, about the, the way it's laid out and the information we'll be learning in September. In October, we'll be plugging into The Power of Habit, uh, a wonderful book that's getting a lot of, uh, of buzz right now as the scientific approach to understanding how habits are formed and how to break them and make uh, good habits as well. Uh, it looks to be a fantastic read. And then in November, We'll be plugging into uh, Eric Chester, best-selling author's book, Reviving Work Ethic, which is a new book released this year that talks about uh, dealing with the uh, emerging workforce, which I suppose would include myself uh, probably in that, in that generation. And so I'm excited to learn a little bit more about some of the challenges and opportunities that exist uh, with that generation of, uh, of new labor force. And that kind of gives you an idea of where we're going. If you haven't already plugged into the discussion on Goodreads, it's very simple. Uh, to get there, you can get there from our site, 12booksgroup.com, or you can go to Goodreads and do a search for 12 books. And uh, very, very easy to do and join. You can sign up if you haven't already with your Facebook account, or you can set up a user account with email address and password. At this point, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Terry. Uh, the first time I spoke to Terry, I was really uh, surprised uh, or, or encouraged or excited about uh, her uh, out-of-the-box approach uh, to, to really helping engage people, both companies and individuals, into taking things to the next level and to really understanding how the different factors of the, of the environment play into success and results. And uh, I think it's become her life work to help people understand how technology, people, and organizational processes really work together uh, to achieve results uh, in, in those environments, whether they be in the workplace or outside of the workplace. And so I'm very, very excited uh, to, to pass it over to Terry. And Terry, I know you've prepared uh, some thoughts for us. And, and before I, I flip over to, to the slides that you've prepared, 
we, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us both on this call and throughout this month, all the uh, time you put into uh, the discussion and the materials that you've uh, been able to, to distribute. Well, Jacob, thanks for that very kind introduction. And uh, to the folks who haven't had the opportunity to see the little introduction video uh, that I had up on the 12 Books site, let me say that I think what Jason is building here is a very plugged in opportunity. Uh, yes, it has technology on it, and I'm going to talk about how technology doesn't have to be the biggest part of your organizational decision, but it certainly wants to play a role. And the fact that he has found a way to address lots of people, that he knew himself well enough, that he knew how to get value both for himself and for other people, and that he set up a group that would help all of us find value. So very plugged in uh, decision and so I was thrilled to be able to participate this last month. The questions were great. They've generated new blog posts. I've got a backlog of blog posts uh, building off some of the questions that were asked. Uh, so thank you to everybody who did that. Um, and I'll give a little you know call out there to Jay who was just great in uh, kicking off great questions all month. But I did want to give a little bit of background. I've been tweeting and posting about how you could certainly join us even if you hadn't read the book or finished the book by this point. Um, as Jason noted, we've got hashtags up there. I do have my Twitter streams open, searching on both those hashtags. Um, I've got the PowerPoint up so I can keep uh, where, where I am, and I look forward to this conversation. So let me just add a little bit to what Jason said. And it's about being able to blend three ideas. Uh, the plugged in manager is not about being plugged into every and all technology. And even when we worked with the publisher, uh, they had to try several times to get the cover designers clear on how we didn't want to see a bunch of power cords. What we wanted to see was something that could go both directions. So how do you use technologies in today's organizations? But how do you use it on an equal playing field with the people, the organizational practice, and then the technology. And when they came back with this image of, you know, kind of round and square and triangular wooden shapes that would fit into a, a template or a puzzle, you know, the only concern I had with it uh, was that it looked fixed and it looked equal. And I want to be real clear from the very beginning, I'm not advocating that technology has to play an equal role in all the decisions we make, either as individuals, as leaders or members of teams, or at the organizational level. But what I'm looking for is a thoughtful process around how to balance those three things, the, the people, the technology, and the organizational process. And let's click on over to that next slide. Uh, I would love to stay connected with all of you. Uh, certainly Twitter is great. Um, I haven't posted this slide deck to SlideShare yet because I think Jason's going to have the whole recording out there. Um, but if you guys want, want me to go ahead and post on SlideShare too, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, Facebook is the place where I like to keep the grounded discussion. And then certainly if you would uh, stay connected to the pluggedinmanager.com or my blog, Technology and Organizations, I'd love to hear your questions. I'd love to hear your examples, your counterexamples, uh, just to kind of continue this discussion and development. And I'm going to be honest that I'm going to be asking questions of you too because I'm working on my next book proposal and I'd love your insights about that. So in summary, as we think about those, those images, it's the people, the technology, and the organizational process. And then a big question is, how do we, how do we blend these things together? I'll be talking about, uh, let's go ahead and kick off the next slide. I'll be talking about three things consistently through this thing. You're going to see the number three multiple times. Uh, thinking about that new book proposal, I'm seeing three things happening in our, in our work environment especially. And even in our retail environment, the environment more broadly. I'm seeing greater transparency from organizations. We've been calling for greater transparency uh, for years, but it's been hard to do. So only very dedicated organizations were really sharing a lot of information with their employees or with the public. Now it's gotten so much easier, and they talk about the value of even CEOs blogging to the broad community, uh, that we start to see more and more transparency. But what we haven't seen as much of, and this is starting to build, there's a pressure here for this, is transparency from the organization's perspective requires 
mature responsibility from the individuals and the full set of employees. One of the things we think about is it's great to be able to go work at Starbucks, but have you actually done an assessment of your own work and your own work style, and even how your technology is going to transfer into that public wireless environment, to know that it's a good idea and to have responsibility to go do that. And then the final thing's a little bit sad. Um, I did love the era when big organizations really cared about the professional development of their employees. Um, in the days when I first started teaching, employee employers were actually paying for people's degrees and then expecting them to come back and work with them and then use those new skills inside the organization. And I've seen a shift where, yes, there are educational benefits for some, but it's on the same level as your dental benefit. And so the organizations don't seem to be looking to how that kind of professional development then pushes back into the organization for benefit. That instead, individuals are being expected to you know, push their own professional growth, not necessarily for the benefit of their current company, but for the good of their own careers and life development. So that, those three things are shifts in the environment. And let's go on to the next slide. One of, the, one of the things I've been able to do while the Olympics were on is kind of use this analogy that plugged in management was or is a life skill. And it's like learning to swim. It's going to make you better off no matter who you are, no matter the situation. It's just a good thing to know how to do to be able to swim, to be plugged in in terms of your management techniques. But let's go on to the next one. When I start talking about where we go from plugged in management into dealing with these contextual changes, you know, the changes about transparency, responsibility, and personal growth. Now we're asking people to use those plugged in skills in a much more complex environment. And instead, you know, instead of it being learning to swim, that life skill, that it's, it's like participating as a great team member in the 4 by 100 medley at the Olympics. You know, that's going up an order of magnitude, maybe two, in terms of what we're expecting people to do. And I'm, I'm still in the process of trying to work out what that means and how to tell that story in a clear way. Because I think the thing that made the plugged in manager successful is that it's a relatively simple story. People, technology, organizational process, being thoughtful about how you blend those things in your own work and in the work of your organization. 2020 engagement's a little bit trickier. And in fact, I'm going to be claiming that we really need to start teaching about that. You know, when, when kids are in high school, I will generally argue that we need to talk to people, talk to kids about plugged in management starting from age nine. Um, you, in the U.S., the average cell phone age uh, where a kid gets a phone is around 9 to 10, 11. And at that point is when I think we should be teaching plugged-in management. So plugged-in management to those kids who are in the 9 and up group, and then 2020 engagement I think is going to be something that really we want to start in high school and then build our organizations around that some more. So let's go ahead and switch again. and both for plugged in management and then at the higher level for 2020 engagement, my contention is that if you've got these things as your goal, if you use plugged in management, if you understand how it's going to fit in the broader environment, and you use these three dim dimensions of people, technology, and organizational process, you're going to expand your capability set, that good things are going to happen. Your ideas will have more traction. and your ideas, uh, your change efforts will succeed more often, which is our next slide. And then let's move on right to the next one after that. You're going to have higher levels of success. You'll stay in front of the pack with the resources that you have. And you know, another framework I found very effective after the book has come out is that people who are interested in leadership are intrigued by these ideas because people who are focused on leadership tend to be focused on people. You know, I'm going to be a visionary, I'm going to show these people the way to go, and it's all about the people, but they tend to leave out two of their other resources. And I don't know anybody today who feels like they have enough of anything. Uh, so if we can do more with the resources we already have, I think we're going to be better off. So I tell these leadership folks, uh, have you built organizational systems that can replicate what you're generally doing, what you're doing as a human? in an organizational way so that it kind of becomes the norm. And similarly, how can you use technology both to leverage how you push out your vision, 
but also how you support people in how they're following you in your vision. So the people, the technology, the organizational process can have value you know, from that point alone. So let's go to the, the next slide. And what you see is kind of the framework for how I'd like to talk with you folks about this. So three dimensions, the people, the technology, the organizational process. And I hope you're not using this as a drinking game because it could be very bad. I say that phrase a lot. Uh, three practices, and that's what I'm going to be diving into here in a minute, and then the three levels. So individual level, your team level, and then the whole organization and the, the organization ecosystem that you work with. So let's go ahead and you know, change slides just here for a minute. I play a little game when I do this talk face to face and I thought I'd, you know, kind of walk through some of the story with you guys. Uh, the, the history, whether it's real or not, is that uh, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg used to play the occasional game of hot or not. And I tell people I like to play a similar game to hot or not, but it's not about, you know, attractive co-eds. Instead, what I'm thinking about is, is this organization, is this manager, is this practice plugged in or disconnected? And if we'll go to the next slide, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have a polling tool built into uh, this thing today, but I'm going to guess that you're like most of my audiences, and when I put this slide up and I ask them, plugged in, disconnected, I usually get a bunch of thumbs down, sometimes uh, some verbal responses that this is not the process people enjoy at the airport. You know, that's not why they're going to the airport, because they're not looking forward to this particular behavior. The argument I'm going to make about this one is that I wonder, and I don't have an insider's view on this, but I wonder if anyone ever thought about how this was going to play out in a, in a broader sense. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. All right. And this one's kind of interesting. You know, Intuit is a company that is local to me here in the Silicon Valley. And I usually put this up, and people go, yeah, TurboTax, Quicken, that's nice. I use it. Yeah, it's fine. But they don't think about Intuit in the same way as they might think about kind of uh, even LinkedIn, and certainly not Google or Apple in terms of their assumptions around the innovative nature of the company. They go, hey, they make you know, software for the small business for the individuals. That's just not that sexy. So plugged in, disconnected, be thinking about that. I'll go ahead and move to the next slide, and I'll start to tell you why I think one of these is not so plugged in and one actually is. Uh, next slide, please. All right, first practice of a plugged in manager is to, to stop, look, and listen. And if we go on to the next slide, I can give you an image of that. I'm told that around the world, little kids are taught, stop, look, listen. Bad things will happen if you don't do this. Well, let's look at the next slide and go real quickly through it and on to the next one. There we go. This is the part I think they might have missed in applying the new TSA um, rules when you come to the airport gate, that they didn't think about how the the position they put you in looks so much like this position. And certainly in the US, we watch a lot of cop shows. And everybody knows that's assuming the position and, and that that's not a good thing. That's not what you want to be doing. And you certainly don't want to be doing it in public. It's just a bad move. Now, imagine uh, a position that was spread legs, fine. Put your arms out to your side, just a little bit of a break off that position. And in fact, the original pictures we were shown before these uh, new rules went into place was of people standing with their arms down. And I'm going to argue that the technology is probably playing a role here, that they found that the images with your arms up were better images. On the other hand, they may have reduced the backlash by a ton had they gone with a, a technologically worse to a degree, but socially much more um, acceptable position. So let's go to the next slide and kind of summarize the, the stop, look, listen practice. So when I'm doing stop, look, listen, and I hopefully do it a lot during every day, is um, I think about myself. Should I be doing this task now? Well, sometimes it's calendar. I'm going to have to do it now. If it's a heavy writing, heavy ideation, creativity task, my personal data suggests, you know, this is from trying these uh, different behaviors at different times of the day, that morning is going to be best. My sort of more, most creative time is during the 8 to 10 o'clock 
a slot. I do ask myself, which technology am I going to want to use to do this? You know, Jason's had to make this kind of a choice in choosing uh, go to my webinar or go to webinar um, because there's a variety of options out there. What was going to be best for his organization, best for his audience um, that he could put into place? So he's making those decisions. What should the task be done in a group or individually? Should it be outsourced? Should I not do it at all? Do I really need a meeting? These are organizational level questions where if I stop, look, and listen, I get to kind of look out over the landscape and then make some choices. The listening part then is how do I know if it's working? Uh, we talk a lot about lean entrepreneurship, lean product development, lean innovation. I don't want to build up an entire superstructure without knowing that this this one small change is going to make a real difference and be positive. So stop, look, listen is the first practice of a plugged-in manager. Let's go on to mixing. And I have to give credit to my friend uh, Lynn here. Uh, next slide, please. Because she's written a bunch of cookbooks, and she said, after listening to me kind of tell my story multiple times, she said, well, you should be talking about making cookies. And I thought that through and, and finally decided she was dead on. As I look at this image, you know, mixing is about taking your ingredients, knowing a good process for putting them together so that the final outcome, the whole, is better than each of these individual things. Because if I look at this picture, except for those chocolate bars, which I think are just fine on their own, nothing else looks good to me. I'm not going to have the vanilla, I'm not going to have the straight butter, the raw eggs, not even the sugar. I want to have the blend and the right blend that's going to make the best cookie for me, for my guests. So let's go on to the next slide and think again about those three things I said I was going to do. The people, you know, when should I do this task? Even a baker knows that different times of day are, are better for the dough to rise and things like that. Uh, what's the best tool? If I use this tool that's really simple but maybe not as powerful, then maybe I'm, I can use it for a broader audience. So I'm kind of balancing the audience that I'm going to have and then thinking thoughtfully about the tool that is going to support them the best for the outcome that we need. And how can the organization maybe take over some of the responsibility for either individual skills or the tools that I pick? How do I blend those things together in the right proportion to make that valuable? Let's go on to Zappos, which is the next slide, and I'll use them as an example. You know, this is just a, a picture of a piece of their assembly line for loading up those boxes that think for things we might have bought. When they built their first warehouse, they were thoughtful about the people who would be working in that warehouse, and they thought, okay, if we buy this technology, then robots are going to have to do it all. If we buy this technology, then human individuals can still play a role, and we need to think about the average height of those individuals because I don't want them reaching up too far. I don't want to have to go get a ladder to be able to pull things down. So I'm going to mix these, these things together in a thoughtful way. Different technology choice means different training means different organizational practices. So they thought nicely and balanced out the best mix for the things that they wanted. And if you go to the next slide, you see how I talk about this in class. And this is called a squish. It's a kid's toy, basically. But what it does is I can stand there with a physical version of this, and I can show that if I pull on, let's say, the red ball, a few other things are going to shift to make it all stay kind of put together. If I took that red bull and a ball and I just pulled on it, and I pulled hard enough, kind of like a two-year-old might do, or a manager who has a very focused view of the world, I could pull and pull and pull, and eventually I'm going to break the whole thing. I have to let some of the other pieces shift in accordance. So maybe I decide that teams are the best way for my organization to work. If I'm going to make that shift, I'm going to change my hiring, I'm going to change my training, I'm going to change the kind of collaboration tools they have. It's all going to support that. I'm never going to try and change just one thing. On the other hand, I'm not going to try and change everything in the organization either. I'm going to change, measure, change, measure. So let's kick, kick off into the sharing slide and then go right ahead to the next one, please, Jacob. Um, Intuit may not look like as sexy a company as Google or Apple, but they are 
plugged in at all levels, really. Uh, they are plugged in at the individual level in terms of the fact that they have what they call unstructured time, 10% unstructured time for the employees of the company. They're plugged in in that they have a process by which employees can suggest changes. Um, so they're, they're raising up the, the connectedness, actually, of everybody else in the company. And they have technology tools that makes that not be a crazy thing to try and manage in a global organization. Entrepreneur Day 2011, 2012, I'm sure going into 2013, into it brings entrepreneurs in. They share uh, you know, what, the, what the roadmap looks like across their different lines of business. They let the entrepreneurs from outside pitch. They have a big exchange of data. And then sometimes they actually buy these companies or just support them in their growth so that maybe they can be an appropriate uh, company to bring into the fold later on. But they've, they've thought about the people. They've built a technology tool that simplifies how the people can be more engaged in the company. And then they share inside the firm very transparently. And then they even bring in outsiders in, in a relatively transparent way. So let's go to the, the last. We're coming into our last three slides. So I have talked to you about three dimensions and three practices. The three levels I've, I've hinted at, individuals, teams, organizations, and then the, you could go up even to four if you wanted to and, and talk about the organization's entire ecosystem. Next slide. Thank you. And what I've seen, what I write about in the book, is basically the idea that if you consider your three dimensions, and if you practice those three practices and share those practices with other people so they can be on board and kind of help you with the whole process, your traction for your own ideas is going to be better, your change success rate is going to go up, and your overall, both individual team and organizational success will also be raised a level. And I can generally talk about a lot of failures. And when I look at those failures, I can generally find that it was because they tried to do one thing at a time. I don't believe you can do that. Um, my colleagues since 1950 moving forward have talked about how you really need to blend these three things. And I think we can see it dramatically in the kind of environment that we're talking about today. So let's go to my, my last slide, just in case you have a pen and now want to write this stuff down. So I'm on Twitter. Uh, as Terry Griffith. Facebook, it's the plugged in manager. Google Plus, I'm there sometimes as well. I'll get these slides uh, on SlideShare if I hear that's what you guys would like. And I just hope you'll be visiting at terrygriffith.com. So Jason, I'm going to call that uh, quits to the, the update. How are you doing? That's, no, that's fantastic, Terry. I appreciate that. I, I, you know, I, I love the idea of 2020 engagement. Uh, I, I think that sounds uh, almost revolutionary. Um, I, I love the idea of, of where that's going. And the idea, you know, when you talked about, uh, you know, the past tendency of teams and organizations uh, to focus on personal development, uh, I think mm -hmm. that struck a chord. I, I, I think that uh, that's something that's changing. And, uh, you know, where, where it's going is going to dramatically impact uh, the labor force and the environment we find ourselves in, and I think that's really insightful. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up for, for questions and answers now. We have quite a few that have popped through already, Terry, but anything you want to say before we jump right in? I, I've been watching Twitter as well. We've had a couple comments there. Well, I'm going to you know, be slicing the audio point where you say that you really like the idea of 2020 engagement and think it's revolutionary, and I'm going to include that with the, uh, the book proposal when it goes to my publisher. <laughs> Absolutely. I, no, I think I think that's really that's really spot on, and and uh, it gets me really excited. Uh, here's here's a question uh, that came in from from a member uh, of the audience here. What social networking tools are companies using internally to enable plugged-in management? Uh, I have been able to interview people at Yammer, um, both about their own use internally, and then how. Uh, their implementation experts have seen it play out. So on my blog, if you actually search on Yammer, you can kind of see the, the full rich story. So I like Yammer because it has a variety of different collaboration capabilities, both sharing documents as well as kind of the Twitter equivalent, but with a higher level of security. Um, I hear good things about Jive, but I don't have as uh, deep a connection to that. I think one of the earliest uh, social text is also 
one of the best for being tightly integrated. You know, when I've had the opportunity to use it, I've, I've liked it a lot. And again, both Jive and, and Social Text are more secure than the consumer grade products that we have out there. But when I give talks about social media and being plugged in using social media, I make a really broad definition because I will say things like shared documents like you might get off Google Docs, uh, wikis certainly, blogs absolutely, no matter which platform someone's using, enterprise grade or consumer grade, those are excellent social media tools for helping us all be more engaged and you know, able to respond to people in our organization's needs more quickly. Uh, I think those are good, good suggestions and uh, some of those I'm familiar with, some not. So I've, I've written those down. I'll be checking into them soon. Here's another good question, Terry. Uh, someone asks, you know, who is the target market for plugged-in management? And I, I think that maybe what they're asking is, you know, who, do, who does this apply to? You know, is it, is it everyone who's in a management position or a certain size of, of organizations or, you know, a mother with a family? Yeah, I'm, I'm often, you know, smiling as I give my response. I think it's everybody. You know, like I said, I think we should be finding appropriate ways to share these ideas, especially the stop, look, listen, and the mixing with kids as young as nine. And, you know, that's certainly a more personal use. So should the nine-year-old be taking their cell phone into class? And if so, how are they going to practice, you know, how to turn it off to not irrigate, irritate the teacher and the things like that? What are the school's rules that you have to stay within? So I'll go all the way as low as nine, and then I'll take it up to everybody who's working inside an organization or even working with an organization as an outsider. Um, in the book, I'm able to talk about individuals who might or might not have been managing, but maybe they were just creating an innovation. And so Tad Milburn uh, out, of, uh, out of Intuit is certainly an example of that. He was a just hired 20-something, and yet because he understands these concepts at least tacitly, was able to be a great success, get this product launched, get a team around him, and then uh, you know, was promoted to support this process and then won into its highest innovation award. So, you know, certainly entry level people will be more successful as managers if you use the ideas and especially the sharing piece, um, you have more leverage, right? Because you are covering more people, you have a little bit more influence, you probably can influence some of those technology choices a little bit more, change organizational practice. So again, great leverage. And if all CEOs or leaders of organizations got these ideas, I think most of us would be less frustrated. Um, I was walking across campus today, and we were, we were kind of picking out examples of things, you know, the school year starting up, where we saw missing pieces, that if they had a, a method of doing effective stop, look, listen, you know, so they had that practice in mind, and then they had some categories like people, technology, organizational process, they might not have as many reworks or things where they try and implement change and it just doesn't fit. Um, and then as individuals dealing in our personal lives, I know I am much more effective on days where I'm being more thoughtful and trying to think about these, these issues. And it's as much as what, what's the task I'm going to do next and why. So, yeah, and then getting into those uh, those three practices, and that makes that makes complete sense. And sometimes we just, well, I was going to say sometimes we don't stop and think about it, but uh, that that almost starts using the lingo. <laughs> uh, here's another good question, Terry. Um, someone asked, uh, one of the things you talk about in your book and in your in your talk is transparency. Isn't this difficult since people who don't have power want transparency, and once they have power, they don't want transparency? <laughs> I think that's going to be something that deserves a fair amount of exploration in the new book. Um, I said, you know, I think I put the date on transparency being acknowledged as something that has great value in around 1970. But if we look back, and you know, so there's the example of Nucor in the book. Nucor was practicing it in the 60s, and it has helped them grow to be the second largest steel company in the US, largest recycler. Um, we both need, from my point, from my perspective and in my position in my own organization, to be sharing the benefits of transparency for everyone. That um, I think a couple 
couple times this week I've seen people talk about what's the organizational value of a CEO t um, having a blog or tweeting. And the value there is they're a credible source about their organization. And I think folks are even starting to collect the data to say, you know, there's empirical value, there's dollar value in those leaders being more transparent. Um, if you're in an organization that's not especially transparent, and you know my organization isn't um, especially, I don't think that's because they're evil or want to hide things. It's just it hasn't been the way that they have grown up in their leadership roles. And so I've given a couple talks here on campus. I, I can't change things from my role, but I can educate people in my role. And so I do the best I can about you know what what are the risks the real risks versus the uh, kind of presumed risks of transparency, and then what, what are the values of people having an easier view about what's going on in their organization and how to move ahead. Uh, I, I love the fact that the U.S. government has put in place some higher transparency demands, and sometimes what we see is great value. If someone has opened up some of the the crime data then an entrepreneur creates an app that lets you see, okay, this time of the day in this particular lo location, no problem. This time of the day, this particular location, the data suggests you don't want to be here. So the more transparent you are, the more you can get lots of other people working for you, sometimes for free. Um, and I think a lot of people don't, uh, don't take that piece on. So it's going to be a challenge. It's been out there in the management uh, world since the 70s. The technologies we have today make it so much easier to do. Um, so the, the transaction cost or you know, what it's going to cost an organization to be more transparent is far less. So maybe we can now start collecting more data about the value and maybe the, the data and the numbers and the dollars are going to help push us along. Yeah, and, and that does seem to be, you know, from my perspective, a transformation uh, that we're seeing. I think there's been some more emphasis recently, both in literature uh, and, uh, you know, some, some outspoken uh, major, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs that are talking about uh, the importance of transparency, how it affects the bottom line, uh, you know, for the, for the, for the better as a, as a positive uh, factor in a business. And uh, that's part of that revolution, I think, that, uh, that will be coming along. Well, Here's another and, great question, Terry. Well, well before, before we go on, I want to put out a call, though. If you see um, articles, examples, anywhere, feed them back to me, because I would love to be able to go and look at those situations and include them. Absolutely. Uh, a couple things come to my mind, Terry. I'll send them over and, and leave that invitation open to, uh, to, the, to the membership. Great. Here's a really, I like this question a lot. Someone, uh, they said, mentors, question mark, who else has led or inspired this work? Oh, that's a that's beautiful question. Uh, I think I see in the introduction that the ideas behind this book are at least 25 years old. It just uh, took me a lot of frustration to actually say, it's important enough, it needs greater leverage, it needs uh, a larger platform, a larger stage, and so I went to the book. So, you know, I would have to say from the beginning, Carnegie Mellon University, where I was doing my master's and my doc doctorate, is a place known for bringing those things together. And so my, my first mentor, the fellow who said, Terry, you should go to Carnegie Mellon, I'll make a call, um, is Zor Shapira, who's at NYU now, because he understood that everything they do talks about this kind of an engagement. Um, beyond him, you know, closer to town, uh, Ted Kochu, who is the founder and CEO of a company that uh, has done a lot of work with video and how to use video kind of in a knowledge management mode, uh, really encouraged me to take on these ideas and to sit down and get the thing packaged up in a, in a book format. Nilifer Merchant does a lovely job uh, of both encouragement about how to grow these ideas um, she's someone who's founded a company, worked at Apple, worked at Autodesk, um, and so has a broad leader's perspective, and she really helps me with the language of all of this. Uh, my editor at Josie Bass actually played a great role in helping me stay focused on something that would be easy to present and talk about and find examples for. Um, and then my advisor, Paul Goodman, I think did a lovely job with high demands around the logic. 
and this would have been back in the very early stages and let me have opportunities to do research inside organizations like General Motors looking at these kinds of questions even back in the, the mid 80s. That's, that's a long list of wonderful people and I think right. maybe that would just help illustrate that uh, some of these things are, are born uh, slowly and it takes a lot of people to get a ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. the acknowledgments uh, section, I really tried to think hard about how many other people have played a role. So I've, I've got a pretty good list there, too. Ah, indeed. Worth double-checking. Uh, another question that just came in, and I'm skipping through a couple, but I thought this is relevant for this particular uh, discussion. Uh, you know, who are some of the thought leaders you follow? Would, would you add names to the list of people you're currently, you know, try to, try to plug into and follow? I'd love to share this list. Uh, you know what I could even do is I'll create a list on Twitter called um, plugged in man. I guess PIM PIM mentors. I'll, I'll create a list on Twitter, and folks that I know are going to end up on that list is Nilifer, and she tweets as at Nilifer. Uh, see, at Nilifer, uh, at Ron, R-A-W-N, Ron Shaw works for IBM, also um, blogs broadly in the business press. Uh, let's see, uh, at Newcom Global, who's uh, Lucy. Lucy does a lovely job because she's an international consultant and helps me think about um, you know, the, the global implications of these issues and how they fit in with different companies. Uh, Jim Sporer at IBM is another one, and he's actually helping me a lot with this uh, 2020 idea because, again, global organization cares a lot about the technology, the people, and the organizational process. Um, Phil Simon is someone who I've just met this last year, but he saw me talking about these integrated issues on Twitter and, you know, said, hey, do you want to get on a call? So he's been very nice, and he comes from a foundation that's similar to my own because he did his undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon. So we, we started out with a common language there. And, you know, if I look at a list I have on Twitter, so I'll highlight this too. Maybe I'll do a, a summary on my own blog. Um, I have a list called Org Systems Thinkers, and those are the people that I'm paying attention to every day. Um, then I have some people who don't happen to be on Twitter, so I have to follow them in other ways. Uh, Maggie Neal is at Stanford and largely a negotiation person, but you see in the book that clear connection back to the methods of negotiation, and she invited me to be a visiting professor at the Kellogg uh, Graduate School of Business. I'll probably get the initials wrong on that one. Uh, long ago, and then we've been able to stay in touch, you know, both through our research and other kinds of connections. And that's where that little nugget came from about how do you actually have a practice of mixing together these things, these issues. And what I'm doing is I'm crossing information systems and how they think about doing analysis for technical tools with the more behavioral context of how do you get people to go along with the ideas that you have. And negotiation is incredibly effective for that. So you see that especially in that mixing chapter. Well, those are good examples. Uh, some of those I've heard of and others I've not. Uh, so uh, a good list to, to plug into, and I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that. Uh, here's another really good question. Um, do you know of any sales force that's using plugged-in management principles? Let me ponder that for a moment. I'm not thinking I had a single sales-focused angle there. As I think back to the people I know who are in larger sales and marketing uh, areas, uh, someone who comes to mind, uh, Shyama Saki, and I'll go ahead and I'll add her to that list because she's, she's one of those people who's just a great connector. You know, she never tries to connect you with someone who wouldn't be a good connection, and she always has a great reason for why she wants to make that connection. And I think that's what salespeople do. Right, is they know how to connect with the customer's needs. They know how to perhaps connect the customer with someone else who's going to better serve their needs. I think mean, that's at the highest level. And one of the other things I respect about Zappos is if somebody else has that shoe that you want but they're out of, they're going to help you find that. Um, so Shyama would be my, my first one, and I will add her to that Twitter list. And I'd love more examples of that because I think they're a, a great community to be reaching out to. 
Yeah, yeah, clearly you can see how plug-in management would be a big part of uh, sales and, uh, and sales management, uh, which is something I play a part of every day. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another good one, Terry, that I really like. Um, you know, any advice for older people who may not be so tech savvy uh, as to be, you know beginning a process of plugged-in management? Right. Don't don't take this as a joke because it's not. Find a 16-year-old. Find a mature 16-year-old who has figured out that not everyone is the same as them. Uh, and you know, leverage them when you do your stop, look, listen. And then if you don't have a 16-year-old, of course, approach anybody else that you think does have a, a broader view into the technology. I end up playing that role here on campus. You know, faculty colleagues will come to me who've been at the university for 35 to 40 years, and they'll say, well, what would you suggest here, and how might it play out? So they have the this, this savvy. They have the plugged in mindset, they just need help in doing the stop, look, listen piece. And I think, you know, it's a great segue because one thing I want to make very clear is you don't have to be a people expert or a technology expert or an organizational systems expert. You just have to know other people who are and respect them enough to help them uh, or to convince them to help you build whatever it is you're trying to do. And you know, if that person is 16 or 51, go go get them or senior senior leaders. So I, I think about uh, you know the senior CEOs that just maybe don't have so much time to share with us, but if you could get a moment of their time, would have brilliant insights, and to then mix those things together. Uh, but it's really more of an issue of having an open mind and knowing how to ask the questions. And they'll let the other people help you with the, the specifics. Right. No, that's, that's fantastic advice. And uh, you know, I, I guess a good goal would be to that to be that person that everyone's going to and asking all these questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, here's another really good one. I, I think is, is critical. And I, I think I had I had asked a similar question during the month on our uh, online discussion about uh, hiring people and the hiring process. But here's a question from someone today. When you are partnering or teaming, how important is it to ensure that you and your partners have a plugged-in fit? The more plugged-in you can be, the better off you're going to be. Uh, the more plugged-in the leader is, even if other folks aren't, the better off you're going to be. And that, that's actually an academic study that we're working on. We're trying to take the, the scenarios that are in the book, tighten them up just a little bit so that we meet kind of academic science um, standards and then go out and find the situations for how much plugged in ability has to be present in the group before what the group does is going to be plugged in. And we think more is better, and if the leader is, that's even better yet. Um, and that goes back to the sharing chapters. Well, then how do I get other people to be doing the, those things so that I don't have to be fighting them? Right? I, I want them to like the ideas. I want them to naturally do the stop, look, listen, naturally do the mixing, um, help me with my sharing. I want that to happen naturally. So the more people in the group that we can have to support us, the better off we are. Now, if I'm an individual without power, it will be a rough road in some cases. You know, Sometimes you can just do that education piece and go, well, why don't we do this first? People will see the value and you can move on. At that point, it's like any other change that's coming from the bottom up. Um, you kind of look for your moments. Uh, I'll call them a learning moment. And then you try and say, why don't we try this? We could try this other thing. Let's put some metrics in place and measure it. And if you measure it and you're showing that your version is going better, that's a, a easier sell than if you're just trying to convince people based on you know your, your own abilities and your own ability to sell a good story. Um, getting leaders to do it. If I were going into a company that didn't think it was very plugged in but wanted to be, I would start at the top and I would work my, myself all the way down because I'd want the, the leaders to understand what was going on first and to give me support for moving on down each level of the organization. Yeah, those are some really important insights uh, in, in what you're saying as far as uh, you know, both working with others internally or externally and really the reality that this is a leadership thing that goes from the top down when, when possible, uh, certainly more effectively that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry, we're, we're running a little bit short on time. We have lots more questions, but uh, I'm going to try and pick two of the best ones here, and, and then we'll wrap it up. So 
Uh, here's one I thought was really good, and, and I think we saw a similar question uh, during the discussion online during the month. When a CEO is measured on delivering short-term results, how can they focus on plug-in management? And that was a great, great question then, and it stays a great one now. Uh, I'd be thinking small. Not sure if that's consistent with the answer I, I gave on the discussion, but as it comes to me right now, I'd be looking for small steps. And I think that also then puts you in alignment with a lot of the ideas about, um, you know, lean, building a company that's lean, um, you know, so you take small steps, you measure and make your next decision. I've heard that, you know, I keep getting asked about lean a lot, so I know it's a growing trend. And it's also a good trend. I don't think it's a, a fad. I think the idea, it fits in with what we call evidence-based management. The idea that you take a small bite has been shown in change research forever to be the best strategy when you can pull it off. And so if I've got short-term goals and I can be plugged in, I'm probably going to hit my short-term goals better than I would if I were just being reactionary. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the questions that we haven't gotten to address yet, you know, please get, get back on to the, the discussion page on 12 books and let's continue the conversation. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic advice. And I will try and uh, hold on to these as well, the ones we don't get to, and, and, uh, and post them there. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, one, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to go I... offline. I'll be on, honest. I'll be offline because I've got to go to class, but I will come back to them as quickly as I can. <laughs> Not a problem. Under, very under, understandable. I think we have time for one more, and I, this is one that uh, I've been looking at here in the queue for a couple of minutes. I, I think it's a really good one. Suggestions you may have about how to make uh, the, the process or plug-in management a habit, uh, specifically stop, look, and listen. Super. I saw something today that was talking about how many hours you have to try something or how many iterations you have to try something before it becomes a, a habit. Um, put up a post-it note. You know, I see as I go by cash registers, uh, I think, what acronym do they have? You know, it's the one about, you know, watch for people stealing stuff. Um, but, you know, stick a post-it note on your, on your laptop screen or, you know, someplace where you're going to be seeing it, and maybe you're on a call in a meeting, and it'll just hit you. You know, either take on the whole plugged-in manager approach or specifically to the stop, look, listen. Just keep that in front of you while you're taking these calls, and you'll start to do it more often. And hopefully people are going to say, wow, that was really good. We actually um, got, had a more efficient meeting as a result. And it'll build upon itself. You know, it's, uh, you're kind of treating yourself like you might treat your pet. When they do something right, give them a treat. When you do it, give yourself a treat. You know. Excellent, excellent question. Probably one worthy of a blog post, frankly. Thanks. Yeah, setting habits is always a, always something worth, uh, worth thinking about and talking about. And uh, I, I think that's going to sort of wrap us up as far as the, the question and answer today. I Sarah, really appreciate all the time and energy you put into our book group uh, this month. Uh, we've had a couple dozen people here uh, with us today this afternoon, but we obviously have much larger group membership that's been able to benefit. Uh, from, from your discussion and from all the materials in the book. And uh, we think it's absolutely fantastic. One more time, I'm pushing up here on the screen uh, Terry's contact information, her website. And uh, I'll just remind uh, readers that as you finish up, it's always a benefit to other readers. Uh, if you can write a review, write a review online, whether that be on Goodreads or on Amazon or wherever you might have bought the book, perhaps uh, via your own uh, social network or, or technology or blog. And I think that's a fantastic way to share uh, more about what we've learned. Uh, also, I'll just quickly mention, and Terry, this is something I'll, I'll feel free to chime in. Uh, you do some events there on campus, uh, workshops and other things. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything on the calendar right now, but there's certainly some that will be upcoming. And uh, you have a special uh, offer, as I understand, 10% off a discount for those events for anyone that's uh, a member of the book group, and all they need to do is mention uh, that when, in, in the registration process, correct? Well, maybe not so much in the registration process. Let me kind of uh, grease, the, grease the rails for them first. So if they'd let me know, hey, I saw you're going to be teaching this thing. Um, I'd like to take it. I'd love the discount. Let me go and kind of set that up for you. And the other thing I want to offer is I love doing work with organizations. And you know, I, I do that as kind of a sideline. Um, 
but if your organization is interested and they are fortunate enough to have you in their audience, uh, let me know that too. And you know, the ten percent discount would apply to your whole organization on that one. Um, and the final thing I wanted to offer, and I, I really don't know how much you guys would find value in this, if you think your company is a great example, I would love to write them up. Um, I blog right now on Technorati, I blog on my own site. If you guys would like a little publicity and can give me an example that in my evaluation really does fit what we're talking about, or a change, maybe you know this is a transformation that you guys are going through, I would love to you know promote what you're able to do. And if you're an individual who's been able to do these kinds of things, maybe in a philanthropic organization, I would love to be able to promote that. So just let me know. Fantastic offers, Terry, and we, we, we appreciate that. I'm sure you're going to get some, some, uh, some contact uh, from members who would be interested in, in that type of uh, help and, and uh, consulting, et cetera. So uh, that's fantastic. Appreciate you so much making that available to members of the group. And again, a big thank you to you from, from myself and from our entire group membership uh, for all that you've done for us this month. This is, uh, the, we're going to wrap it up. This is the conclusion of our webinar today. We appreciate everyone's thoughts and comments and uh, questions. And for those who we weren't able to get to your questions, again, I'd encourage you to uh, visit our Goodreads group and continue the discussion there uh, in, in the future uh, days and weeks. This is Jacob Paulson in Denver, Colorado, signing off. Have a wonderful afternoon and holiday weekend upcoming. Thank you so much for everything you do, and we'll see you back next month.